Here we go. Right. My pleasure to have Isabel Volt, who speak now on Brill Nertha theory over the Herbert space. Take it away. Thanks. Okay, so it's really great to be here. Thanks uh, for inviting me to speak at this marathon, to run in this marathon. So um, yes, I'm going to be talking about Brill Nertha theory over the Hurwitz space. And everything I say that is original is joint work with Eric Larson and Hannah Larson, and it can be found in this preprint that got posted on the archive last week. Okay, so this talk is going to be about the representation theory of curves, which is to say, uh, to study algebraic curves, um, we can split the problem into studying abstract curves and then studying realizations of these curves via explicit equations in projective space. And I'm gonna focus here on the second uh, problem. So the overarching question is, given a genus G curve uh, C, what is the geometry of the space of maps of this curve to projective space of dimension R of some fixed degree D? And um, of course, uh, by the um, correspondence between uh, maps to projective space and line bundles, this data um, is equivalent to a line bundle L in pick D of the curve and a subspace inside of the global sections of L of dimension at least R, well, I'll say equal, so subspace, dimension R plus one, um, that's space point free. So um, given this, it's natural, a natural player in the study of maps of curves to projective space are brill nother loci. So this is gonna be um, a locus inside of the Picard variety of the curve attached to two discrete invariants, the degree. So it's going to be loci of line bundles of degree D on the curve and um, an integer R, which indexes uh, the dimension um, of the space of sections. So the space of sections of this line bundle has to be at least R plus one dimensional. So by, by what I just said, um, these are the line bundles that could give rise to maps from C to PR of degree D. So I think when you see one of these sub varieties, um, it's very natural to ask some very basic geometric questions. Um, is it non-empty? So that's asking roughly when does C admit a map to PR of degree at most D, uh, what's its dimension? So that's asking roughly in how many ways? Well, that's one interpretation of the way of saying in how many ways, how does this space of maps vary? Um, another thing is asking just the discrete ways that it varies. So that's asking, is this locus irreducible? So this is what are the discrete invariants? And in general, um, if I don't tell you anything about the curve C, these are pretty hard questions to answer in general. Um, but uh, answers, very you know, satisfying answers to these questions and more are known when the moduli of the curve is general. And this is uh, in the brill noether theorem, or what I am calling the entire brill noether theorem, which is actually a sequence of papers um, from the 80s, from the 70s and 80s. So the first part is about this dimension statement. Um, and it's what goes under the classical Brill-Nother theorem uh, heading. So it was proved by Griffiths and Harris in the 80s that WRD um, has dimension, which is called the Brill-Nother number, rho of GRD, which is G minus R plus one times G minus D plus R. And I should say, you're supposed to interpret, uh, of course, the maximum dimension is G because it's a sub variety of pick D. So if this is positive, I mean, it can be at most G. Um, and this is the expected dimension. If you set up some expectation for what the dimension of this variety is, this is what you get. So this is saying it behaves as expected. And you're supposed to read out of this that it's not empty exactly when this brill nother number is greater than or equal to zero. So everything is as nice as possible when the curve is general from this perspective. Um, furthermore, we know a lot about the local structure of this variety. So this is 
um, the content of the Giesecker Petri theorem proved by Giesecker, saying that this, this variety, well, the main content is that it's smooth away from WR plus 1D of C, which is, of course, contained in WRD, because if a line bundle has at least R plus 2 sections, it, of course, has at least R plus 1 sections. Um, but it can be singular along that uh, more special locus. Um, and then in general, even, you know, but the singularities are very mild. So uh, it's Cohen-Macaulay. That actually is not that um, difficult in this classical case because uh, it's a determinantal locus. And so once it has the right dimension, it's Cohen-Macaulay. Um, but furthermore, it's normal, which is, um, can be deduced from the Cohen-Macaulay-ness and the fact that these WR plus 1 D of C always have co-dimension at least two. So using Sayre's criteria, you get normality. OK, so that's relatively nice. Um, moving on, you can answer enumerative questions. So the fact that it's a, it's a determinantal locus, you can use the Proteus formula. And this was worked out by Kempf and Kleiman and Laxoff independently. And in the Chow ring of the um, Picard variety, this, the class of this Brunner locus is this very explicit constant times the appropriate power of the theta divisor. And in particular, this tells you that when rho is zero and it's just finite, you can enumerate what it is. And it's this you know, explicit quantity, uh, which I will um, maybe call n of d and r to emphasize that it doesn't it doesn't depend on G because you can back solve for G because uh, it had to be rho is zero. All right. And then um, a nice thing that you can deduce from a connectedness result of Fulton and Lazarsfeld together with the normality that came from Giesecker's result is that this WRD really is irreducible. So um, I, I think this is a when, when you expect it to be, when its dimension is positive. So when rho is greater than zero. Um, and I think this is really nice because it tells you that, um, that R and D really are the only discrete invariants of maps to projective space. You have to tell me the degree and you have to tell me what projective space you're going to. Um, but you can see it's, it's not irreducible when rho is zero most of the time by part three because um, we can count how many points there are. Uh, but there is still a sense in which you can prove irreducibility, um, and that was proved by Eisenbud and Harris. Um, so you can look at the universal WRD over the moduli space of curves, and uh, when rho is greater than or equal to zero, this has a unique irreducible component that dominates, oh, I lost a G, dominates MG. Um, so when rho is positive, this follows from part four, and when rho is zero, that's really the interesting case. So the interesting case is when rho equals zero, in which case it's a generically finite cover of mg. And this statement is really saying that the monodromy is transitive. So the picture that emerges from this is that WRD is um, an irreducible subvariety of the Picard variety. It's um, mildly singular, but it's only mildly singular along WR plus 1D, and it has the expected dimension. So basically, what you want to know is true. And I, and I think this is a very satisfying answer when the moduli of the curve is general. And a, and a real crowning achievement of classical algebraic geometry in the 80s. But um, in nature, we often come across curves that are already given to us via some map to projective space, uh, the, the curves that you meet in real life. And uh, the thing about this is this, this may force this curve C to be special in MG. So the first case of this is when C is a general curve equipped with a degree K map to P1. It's a very natural way to encounter curves in real life. And um, C will be special if K is strictly less 
than the expected gonality, which is g plus 3 over 2. Um, so one way of, of stating this first natural case is I'm going to look at a general curve of fixed gonality less than the maximum gonality. And um, basically, right, since the completion of the classical Brunner theorem at the end of the 80s, people have been working on this next case to try to understand an analogous picture for curves equipped with a map to P1. Um, and despite a lot of work, the picture is much less clear, and it's, it's much less satisfyingly simple than what we saw in the case of a, of a curve of, of, um, of general moduli. So a um, bunch of papers in the 90s and early 2000s by Copens, Martins, Keem, Valico, and others uh, showed that this um, Brillnother locus can have many irreducible components. So R and D, I want to emphasize, are not the only discrete invariance. And these components can have the quote unquote wrong dimension. They're not of the dimension given by the Brillnother no their number. So um, this was sort of unsettling and mysterious uh, at the time. But some striking work came uh, just a few years ago in papers that either appeared in print in 2017 or on the archive. So Nathan Flieger showed, gave an upper bound on, um, and, and the best upper bound that had been given so far, other people had worked on this, for the largest component, for the dimension of the largest component of WRDFC. And then Dave Jensen and Drew Ranganathan showed that this was actually achieved. So what they did, in effect, was prove an analog of the dimension statement of the Brillnother theorem. They determined the dimension. However, there are many components, so they only determined the dimension of the largest component. So it's somewhat unsatisfying still because there are these other components out there and we don't really understand them. So this begs the question, how do we explain these other components? So um, the end of uh, or summer of last year, uh, independently, my collaborator, Hannah Larson, and also uh, Kaylin Cook Powell and Dave Jensen suggested that these other components could be explained by splitting loci. So that is, they demonstrated another discrete invariant besides R and D. So uh, let me explain that. So if I have a curve equipped with a map to P1 of degree K, and I have a line bundle in pick D of the curve, then I can push forward this line bundle to P1, and this is going to be a vector bundle of rank K on P1. And so by the Birkhoff Grothendieck theorem, it splits as a direct sum of line bundles O of E1 through O of EK. And I'm going to abbreviate this as O of vector E. And this vector E is what I call the splitting type of the line bundle. So um, the reason why they, uh, Hannah and Kaylin and Dave, proposed the splitting type as a refinement is because um, this finite map, F from C to P1, is, of course, affine. And so the space of global sections um, of the line bundle L on C is identified with the space of global sections on P1 of its push forward, which is just something you know, very combinatorially calculated in terms of the splitting type, O of E. And so in particular, this tells us that knowing the splitting type E, it's a refinement of the pair R and D. So there's our potential new discrete invariant. So we make the definition. Um, w E of C is going to be the line bundles on the curve whose push forward has splitting type O of E or a specialization thereof. And this specialization, I should say, it's very well known. It's just called majorization, um, just something combinatorial in terms of the splitting type. So explicitly, to show you that this really does have a very explicit concrete scheme structure, let me just write it down. So a line bundle will be in, in W, E of C, if and only if its space of global sections under all twists by the pullback of O of 1 from P1 has the right number of sections as prescribed by the splitting type. 
And the reason why this is the condition is because splitting types of vector bundles on P1 are determined by um, all of the conditions for how many sections they have under various twists. And actually only finitely many twists are necessary. So this locus WE, it's not a determinantal locus in general anymore, but it's an intersection of determinantal loci, a usually non-transverse intersection of determinantal loci. So its geometry is much more subtle. So um, by what I said, uh, WR, by this refinement that I said here, um, WRD of C is a union over um, the splitting types that have at least R plus one global sections of these brill noether splitting loci, WE of C. So having made this definition, um, it was really, um, a very, I think, big insight of Hannah Larson in her paper in 2019, which is that we don't really understand the dimensions of these components of WRD, thinking about them just as Bronother loci. However, they're completely explained by thinking about them as splitting loci. So it's not that they have the wrong dimension, it's that we were doing the wrong dimension estimate. So actually, they have the correct um, expected dimension for being a splitting locus, which is G minus, well, the expected co-dimension by deformation theory of vector bundles on P1 is H1 of N O of E. So I'm going to call this quantity U of E, that's the expected co-dimension. And, and they do, in fact, have the expected co-dimension. So Hannah proved this in her paper in 2019, and it was recently reproved uh, using tropical techniques by Cook, Powell, and Jensen in a paper that appeared on the archive last month. Um, and there was also some partial progress towards analogs of part two and three of the Brill Noether theorem, which, to remind you, were about the singularities and about the class or the enumeration. So, uh, this partial progress so, Hannah proved that um, WE of C is smooth away from more unbalanced splitting loci, so WE prime of C, where E prime is a specialization of E. Uh, and further, it has class, which has a form reminiscent of what was known in the classical case. So it's some constant times a power, the appropriate power of the theta divisor. Um, but this constant, let me indicate what you're supposed to take away from this. Um, this N of E, as is indicated by the notation, depends only on the splitting type E, not on G, but we don't know what it is, but don't know what it is. And in particular, since I've separated out this um, U of E factorial, another description of it is it's the number of points in W E of C when rho prime of G E is zero, so when it's finite but we don't know what it is. And so the splitting type looked really good. It looked like a really good candidate um, discrete invariant because um, it completely explained the dimensions. However, that doesn't prove that it actually is the only discrete invariant. There could be another discrete invariant out there. There could be more components that we don't know about um, that uh, besides the splitting type. So that's sort of the state we were in in 2019. And um, the reason is that uh, the degenerative arguments that were used were only able to access local information like dimension or singularities um, because we had no way of going back from a degeneration to the general fiber. That was sort of the stumbling block and what prevented anybody from pushing these results further. So the main theorem that I'm going to tell you uh, today is built on such a way of going backwards. And so we, we do get a full global understanding of the Brill Noether loci. So again, this is joint work with Eric Larson and Hannah Larson, and it just appeared on the archive. So um, I'm going to let F from C to P1 be a general degree K genus G cover. So first, a little more about the local structure. Um, we can prove that it's Cohen Macaulay. Which is, um, which is not obvious in this case because it's not a determinantal locus. It's a non-transverse intersection of determinantal loci. 
And we can strengthen Hannah's results a little more that it's actually smooth away from the union of all more unbalanced splitting loci that have co-dimension two or more, which you actually do need to do because co-dimension one can occur in this case. And so now combining Cohen macaulay and this um, result, you get that it's also normal. So again, it has very mild singularities that we understand. Um, next, so this was on to the class and enumeration. So we already knew a lot about the class, except we didn't know what these numbers were. So uh, more on this will come later, but we now have a description for these numbers in terms of a very well-studied problem in the theory of Coxeter groups. And in particular, there are recursive formulas. And for any fixed K, there's, it has a rational generating function. So you could write down um, a closed formula for any particular K. Um, and then the thing that I was really excited about uh, in this project is we can prove that WE is irreducible if, it, if you expect it to be, so if the dimension is positive. And um, so I think this you know, is a big block of evidence saying that E is, is the only remaining discrete invariant, which is cemented by the fact that we can prove the monodromy statement, that uh, the universal WE has a unique component dominating, in this case, the Hurwitz space. And I should add, when uh, rho prime of G E is greater than or equal to zero, the cases that we can actually attack. And again, um, this is most interesting in the case where it is actually equal to zero, and this says that the monodromy is transitive. All right, so maybe I'll pause here for um, uh, 15 seconds if people want to ask questions at this point, and then I'll start saying how we um, approach this problem. Is there an explanation why this WE is the, or rho E is the expected dimension? Why is this the expected dimension? Yes. Um, it comes from the deformation theory of vector bundles on P1. So this is the expected co-dimension having splitting type E, is this H1 of N O of E. That's, yeah. If you just work out the deformation theory, that's the, that's the co-dimension that you get for these in the versatile deformation space of vector bundles on P1, that's the co-dimension of the splitting loc the vector bundles that maintain splitting locus of type E or a specialization thereof. Which you can write down again using the using just the numbers E1 through EK, you can write an explicit formula for this. But um, I'm gonna just write it as this H1 to make it apparent that it comes from deformation theory. But it's not a determinantal expected dimension because it's not just a determinantal locus. More questions? Okay. So, um, as in previous work, we attack this problem via degeneration. So the degeneration that we're going to take is to a chain of elliptic curves. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to denote this by X. That's going to be my chain of elliptic curves. Um, G elliptic curves, which are joined at nodes um, P1 through PG minus 1, as I've indicated here. And the condition is that PI minus 1 minus PI is exact K torsion on EI, which says if I take the, the function that, that um, illustrates the linear equivalence between K times PI minus 1 and K times PI, I get a degree K map to P1 from each elliptic curve, which is totally ramified at the points PI minus 1 and PI. So when I glue all these maps together, I get a map from X to a chain of P1s that's totally ramified in each one of the nodes. And so the theory of admissible covers tells me that I can smooth this to smooth degree K covers. So this is actually in the limit of the um, K Donald locus. Okay, so um, 
line bundles on the general fiber. So we're going to take a degeneration, um, a smooth, so here's my little cartoon picture, a smooth total space X um, over spec of a DVR, which I'll denote B. Um, and so this X star is the general fiber, which is one of my general curves of genus G. And I have a line bundle L star on this with splitting type E. And I want to know what information do I get in specialization. So because the total space is smooth, um, I can always uh, close this up to um, a line bundle on the total space. So I can get some line bundle on the total space, which when I restrict it to X, gives me a limit L. But this limit is far from unique, of course, um, because if I take any component, EI, and I twist this limit by it, it's another limit. So pictorially, I could have something supported entirely on the central fiber. Um, and so using this idea, you can make um, a limit with any distribution of degrees um, on uh, the components EI. So I'm going to denote that L vector D is the uh, limit that has that particular um, degree distribution. And so, um, and now we know if, so going back sort of up here, we know that if the line bundle on the general fiber is in WE, then this, then every one of these possible limits cannot violate upper semi-continuity of spaces of global sections. So um, what that means is that H naught of any one of these LDs twisted appropriately by M has to be at least H naught of O of E twisted by M, the conditions that cut out the splitting locus, and this has to be for any degree distribution D. And such limits, which of course um, are defined up to twisting um, by components on the central fiber, we term E positive limit line bundles. So it's some positivity condition imposed by the splitting type E. And the way that people index these line bundles, which are only defined up to uh, twists by on things on the component is by keeping track of the line bundle, which I'm going to denote Li, uh, which is the line bundle on the i component for the particular degree distribution that has all of its degree concentrated on that component. So degree D on that component and zero elsewhere. So I'm going to keep track of each one of these line bundles. And then by appropriate twisting of the nodes, I can build the line bundle, the limit with any degree distribution I want. Okay, so that's sort of some hypothetical data on the central fiber. And furthermore, this data has a lot of structure. So this was um, worked out by Kaylin Kukow and Dave Jensen in a recent paper in a further tropical degeneration of the one that we have here. And we give an independent classical proof in, in our degeneration. So um, the components of WE, so I, let me say, I'm going to denote this locus of E positive line bundles. I'm going to denote it WE of X. And it has the scheme structure denoted. This, this gives me the scheme structure. OK. So um, the components on WE of X are indexed by a very nice combinatorial object. They're indexed by K regular fillings of a certain Young diagram, which I'm going to call gamma of E, associated to the splitting type E. And I'll tell you how to build this a little bit later. Um, and these fillings use exactly the co-dimension number of symbols, U of E symbols. And I'm going to say what K regular is. But let me just give you a little example. So here's, here's an example of a filling and an example of one of these Young diagrams for the splitting type minus 202, which is everyone's favorite small example where it's not a determinantal locus. Um, and the, what this filling conveys is that when a number um, i appears in row r and column c, so for instance, this 3 over here, um, it means that the line bundle on that component i, this li, is determined to be a particular linear combination of the nodes. And that linear combination depends on this quantity c minus r, so on the diagonal index of that box in the tableau. 
And now you notice that I'm allowed to repeat symbols. I have this three in two positions. Um, I'm allowed to re repeat symbols because pi minus one and pi differ by k torsion. So if I change the coefficients by something that is the same modulo k, it doesn't matter. And so k regular means I can repeat symbols, but they have to be lattice distance k apart. So um, this is a very nice description of the components of WE on the central fiber, but I should note, warning, that this description at the moment is only set theoretic. It's only an indexing tool. It doesn't tell us that actually scheme theoretically, this locus is cut out by these particular conditions on the line bundles. That is something we're gonna have to prove to be able to do any of these results that I told you. We're gonna have to upgrade the set theoretic indexing to a scheme theoretic statement. Um, but even just having this nice description on the central fiber, which is very nice, we still don't know that every one of these E positive line bundles on the central fiber of our degeneration actually arises as a limit of a line bundle with splitting type E. We don't have any way of going backwards. So what we need is we need a regeneration theorem. It's not good enough just to degenerate if you want to know global information. And in the classical Gromother theorem, there is a regeneration theorem proved by Eisenbud and Harris. So what they do, um, how their regeneration theorem works, is they build um, a scheme over the base, which on the general fiber parameterizes linear series for the line bundle on the general fiber, and on the special fiber parameterizes linear series for each of the LIs with appropriate compatibility. And the genius of this argument is that they're just able to do dimension estimates to show that every component has at least a certain dimension. And so if you know that the central fiber has the correct dimension, that means you can't have any small components that are supported just at the central fiber. They have to spread out to the general fiber. And that's what allows you to do regeneration, to prove that everything comes from the general fiber. Um, but in our setting, really the, the, the thing that made Eisenbud and Harris's regeneration theorem work was the fact that they had dimension estimates. And for us, these fail, their dimension estimates fail precisely because WE can have the wrong dimension. So out of the bag, you can't use the Eisenbud-Harris regeneration theorem. So what we have to do, sort of the part of the paper, is we have to construct a scheme that parameterizes, like they did, certain rigidifications of E-positive line bundles. So in our case, it's not just a linear series. It's what we call an E-nested linear series and an E-nested limit linear series. But I want to point out something important, which is that in Eisenbud and Harris's regeneration theorem, it was like relatively obvious that these uh, linear series with the appropriate compatibility conditions existed. And so anytime you had something that looked like a limit, it satisfied this, and so it was a limit. But for us, it's, it's highly non-obvious that the objects on the central fiber have the conditions necessary to regenerate the general fiber. So it's, it's really non-obvious that these appropriate rigidifications exist. Um, and what implies that they exist is actually this hidden structure that's lurking in the central fiber in these K regular fillings of Tableau. So that's uh, what I'm going to turn to for the rest of the uh, talk. So I'm going to disrupt, I'm going to really explain this structure that exists on the central fiber that allows the regeneration theorem and basically every other result in the paper, because every result in the paper comes from understanding the structure on the central fiber and porting it to the general fiber by the regeneration theorem. Um, so I won't be able to tell you exactly which particular properties on the central fiber means that these rigidifications exist, because I haven't told you what the rigidifications are, but I hope to convince you that we have such a deep understanding of the central fiber that 
um, we can't possibly not know what we need to know. Okay, so if you're now focusing on the central fiber, um, the first thing that you might look for is a set theoretic description of the components, and um, we're happy because we have that. They correspond to these um, fillings of particular Young diagrams. So this is uh, was worked out by Cook, Powell, and Jensen. Um, but even when you have that description, as I said, you still need to understand the lurking combinatorial structure. And for us, that's going to come in the form of realizing the relationship with the affine symmetric group, which is a certain uh, coxeter group, infinite coxeter group. And um, actually, that structure of the coxeter group is what's going to allow us to construct these rigidifications. And then finally, you have to turn your scheme theoretic your set theoretic description of the central fiber into a scheme theoretic description. So the way that we do that is we prove that this description is, this locus is actually reduced, this WE locus, and therefore um, the set theoretic description coincides with the entire locus. So this is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk, parts two and three. So let's move on to part two. Um, about the combinatorics of the central fiber, this lurking combinatorial structure. So now I'm going to tell you how you construct the Young diagram, gamma of E, that I alluded to. So it's, um, it's built out of left justified overlapping rectangles, and you're going to have one rectangle for each twist, M, so that both H0 of O of E of M and H1 of O of E of M are non-zero. And the number of boxes is you'll have a rectangle which is size H1 by H0. So this may be slightly confusing when I say it like this, but let me show you an example which hopefully will answer all questions. Um, here's a tetragonal example. Um, so I take the splitting type uh, minus 2, uh, 0, 0, 2. And um, so the first, the smallest twist that has both H0 and H1 is if I twist down by um, 2. I get this little uh, rectangle. I get a square if I twist up by one again. And then if I just take the splitting type as I've shown it to you, I get a horizontal rectangle. I take all of these and I smoosh them to the left together, and that gives me gamma of E. So it depends only on the splitting type E. Um, and one of the things that, that I think is really nice in this story is that these gamma of E are an example of a much more general class of Young diagrams that were studied by combinatorialists um, for a long time, which are called K cores. And I like to think of K cores as a discrete, so this is a K discrete convexity property. And what it says is that if I look at the boundary of my Young diagram, as I've drawn here, and I look in, in any residue class of boundary segments, which I've colored for you in this diagram, then every residue class of boundary segments is composed of an infinite sequence of vertical segments, of course, because it starts in this infinite vertical sequence, and ends with an infinite sequence of horizontal segments. Um, but once the switch from vertical to horizontal happens, it never goes back. So just an example, let's follow this blue one, or that's not a very interesting one. Follow this green one, it's uh, vertical, vertical, horizontal, 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 forever. So um, clearly, a, uh, an important invariant, or basically the entire invariant of a k-core, is the first time each boundary segment becomes horizontal, because that tells you uh, yeah, where the switch happens. So let me just highlight them for you here. This is the first time the blue segment is horizontal, the first time for green, for red, and then for purple, it's all the way over here. So that's going to come back in a second. All right. So um, as I already said, K cores are intimately related to the combinatorics of a coxeter group, uh, namely the affine symmetric group. So the affine symmetric group, uh, denoted SK tilde, is the um, Coxeter group with K generators, which I'll denote um, S1 through SK. And it has these two types of relations. SI, SJ is SJ, SI, when I and J do not differ by plus or minus 1. And SI, SI plus 1, SI is SI plus 1, SI, SI plus 1. 
So that's sort of the standard Coxeter group um, uh, definition of the affine symmetric group with generators and relations. Um, but alternatively, you can view it as the group of permutations from Z to C that are K periodic. So F of X plus K is F of X plus K and uh, appropriately normalized. So the sum of the first K values, which of course determines F by the periodicity, is the same as just the sum of the first K numbers. Okay, so the set of K cores admits a left action of the affine symmetric group, which I'll show you in this example in a way that you should be able to fill in what the action is in general. So um, acting by S1 on this tableau on the left adds a box in every residue class in which it's in every residue class one of the boundary segments uh, in which it's possible to add one. So it's possible to add one here and here, but not here. And um, otherwise, if, there's, if it's not possible to add one, but it's possible to delete one, you delete every box in that residue class that's possible to delete. And if you can neither add nor delete, then you do nothing. Um, and the fact that these aren't mixed up, the fact that you can't both add boxes and delete boxes comes from this k-convexity property. So that defines this action. And in fact, the set of k cores is isomorphic to the quotient of sk tilde by sk, um, which is just reordering. And this is sk tilde equivariant for the left action of sk tilde. And I can tell you exactly what it is. So I take this k core, which I said was determined by the first horizontal segment in each residue class. So here, again, I've drawn them. I keep track of the diagonal index of those segments, so the row minus the, co the column minus the row, and then I make the permutation from Z to Z that sends one through four to these um, elements. That's the corresponding element of the affine symmetric group. So um, this, this tells us some stuff about the tableau, gamma V, but it doesn't really tell us about the filling of it immediately. Um, but that was studied by combinatorialists in um, the early 2000s. And uh, the main work was um, a theorem of Lapointe and Morse from 2005, which says that efficient fillings of a K core, K regular fillings, and efficient means using the minimum number of symbols, are the same thing as reduced words in the affine symmetric group. And you can see why this should be true, because a filling is sort of instructions for how to build up the tableau inductively. So um, if I start from the empty tableau, then um, this one here in this filling is telling me the first thing I should do is I should add a box in residue class um, one, so in residue class four, so that's multiplying by the generator S4. And similarly, all of these other numbers are telling me uh, how to build up the entire tableau inductively. And at the end, I get a reduced word for the, for the um, element of the affine symmetric group. So um, we show that this notion of efficient, that the combinatorialists have uh, for the particular K cores that we're interested in, which are these uh, gamma of VEC E's, are, uh, that notion of efficient is the same as using this um, U of E number of symbols, which is, uh, yeah, just to remind you, H1 of N O E. So this notion really does line up with the combinatorial notion. And so in particular, this tells us that this mystery number is just the number of reduced words for a particular element of the affine symmetric group that I've um, demonstrated how to construct up here. And so because of that, it's, it's, a, it's received a lot of attention in the combinatorics community, and there are recursive formulas and rational generating functions and the like. OK, so in my remaining five minutes, I want to do the last sort of really meat on the central fiber, which is to, um, to prove reducedness or to sketch the proof of reducedness. So we now we need to um, figure out how the sausage is made on the actual scheme structure itself, not just set theoretically. But recall that the scheme structure is given by an intersection of different loci, which are like line bundles in pick D, so when I specify a particular degree distribution on the central fiber that have at least some number of sections. And I need to do this 
over different Ds and for different Rs corresponding to different twists. So more formally, um, I can think about this uh, in the universal family of line bundles of uh, degree distribution D on X. So on this um, X cross pick D, I have the universal bundle and mapping down to um, pick D of X. And what I want is I want the locus on the base where uh, this bundle has enough sections, some number of sections. But I can't just push forward this bundle itself because I might not get a vector bundle on the base because it might not have degrees that's large enough to guarantee I don't have H1. So what I do to get around that is twist by a very large relative divisor D, which meets all of the components on the central fiber. This is sort of the standard trick. And then I look um, for the rank of the evaluation map of the push forward of um, L twisted up by D, which will be a vector bundle if D was large enough, to uh, the push forward of L twisted up by D restricted to D, again, will be a vector bundle if D was large enough. Um, and I and my loci are going to be when this evaluation map has rank, which is at most some quantity, which is going to tell me that the kernel, the sections that actually um, come from sections of L, uh, they're big enough. And just to illustrate this, this rank locus, it lives inside this pick D of X, which remember was composed of elliptic curves. So it's just a product of picks of elliptic curves. So it's just a product of elliptic curves. It's a well understood object. Um, so the claim is that um, any intersection of rank loci of this form always has this simple description. It's a reduced union of pre-images of points under various projection maps. So here's an example. I project, I might have this locus look like the pre-image of this point, um, this purple point under the projection to E1 cross E2. So that would give me this line in the product or I could take the pre-image of a point under projection to E3, and that will give me this sort of um, abelian variety two plane in the product. Um, well, actually, it's enough to prove this claim for one such rank locus of this form, because intersections of reduced unions of pre-images under projections are themselves reduced unions of pre-images under projections. So that's why this description is very nice. So let's do this in a baby case. So the baby case is that I don't actually have a chain of many different elliptic curves. I just have one elliptic curve. So here's my schematic in that case. And I'm asking for the rank of this map of vector bundles to be at most n. And uh, what you notice is that because it's an elliptic curve, we really understand so much that um, there's, there's only, in most cases, it doesn't depend on the moduli of the point in the base at all. This rank locus is either empty, it never happens, or it's all of pick D, it always happens. And there's one case where it might depend on the moduli of the line bundle, and that's if the degree is zero. And I'm asking that, so when the degree is zero, both of these are vector bundles of rank equal to the degree of D. And I'm asking that this map does not have maximal rank. So I'm asking that its rank is at most the degree of D minus one. And in that case, it's easy to see that um, set theoretically, it's a single point, which is just the line bundle O. Obviously, the line bundle of degree zero, you have to get that um, that would be uh, give you this non trivial space of sections. And um, a growth in degree one rock calculation shows is what shows scheme theoretically that it's just a reduced point. Okay, so it was really relatively straightforward in that case. Um, but uh, actually, this baby case of one elliptic curve solves the entire problem. And the reason why it solves the entire problem is that, in general, we can rewrite this rank condition on our chain of elliptic curves as a condition on the normalization, this um, union of elliptic curves. And the reason is because sections of L here on this chain are going to be the same thing as sections on the normalization that agree at the nodes where the components meet. And so I can rephrase this as a problem on the normalization, which means that it's going to be something about a map of vector bundles. And this map of vector bundles on the base is going to be almost block diagonal. 
It's going to have these block pieces that come from evaluations along the components of D that were supported on each one of these elliptic curves. And then they're very minimally interacting. They only interact in sort of one little shared row for each of them corresponding to the nodes. So if it were actually block diagonal, then um, this beautiful fact that I'm sure we all know and love, that if scheme theoretically, the rank loci of a block diagonal matrix are just the unions of products of rank loci of the blocks. But you can work out um, explicitly that in the case where they're minimally interacting, it's almost block diagonal, it's still a union of rank loci of things related to these blocks, where sometimes you take just this evaluation and sometimes you add in the rows where they interact. And so what this says um, is that because these are still evaluations of line bundles on elliptic curves at points, which now might include the node points, um, our baby case tells us that it's still going to look like reduced pre-images of points under projections. And so the entire locus is reduced. So I think that's the end of my time. So I'll stop there. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. So any questions, either turn on your microphone or use the chat and ask, Isabel? I'll wait. Uh, my, whilst people are thinking, I had one. So your story was for a general C to P1, is that correct? Yes. Right, but then, so do you expect, right, so we can, can we not refine your question again? There could be special ones of those. I don't know. There could be special ones of those. Two maps, and two maps to P1, given, given maps to P1 with two splitting types, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, I'm, I've come Yeah, on. definitely. There could be special ones. And I think this opens up a host of other questions if you come equipped with some special, some given map to projective space, which is not P1, what can you say about these? And I think those are mostly open. We're sort of in the exploratory stage right now. But I think my sense is that if you talk to people who worked on this in the 90s um, and the early 2000s, they didn't know that there was a nice, they wouldn't expect such a nice answer that you just had to keep track of the splitting type. But um, so I think right now it seems murky and we don't know what's going on, but maybe there's a similarly nice answer. Any other questions? You can look also at maps to other curves. Is in the simplest cases, is there anything nice there? I don't know. I, I haven't looked at it. Maybe you could imagine that um, knowing something about the harder neuroseam on filtration of the push forward would tell you um, something, but I again it's it's all speculative at this moment. I guess the case for a map to an elliptic curve would be the first, that, you know, double cover of an elliptic curve, in fact, would be the first one, elliptic, hyperelliptic. Yes, exactly. So, so you, you guys get these, um, these uh, cyclotheoretic formulas for, um, for, these, uh, for the different um, kind of splitting loci? Is there a chance of uh, kind of a global formula over the Hurwitz space for something like that? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Are you saying, do you want the case when it doesn't dominate the Hurwitz space? You want to know something about the cycle in the Hurwitz space that you get of curves? Yeah, so I, 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 I guess what I mean is, you know, there, there are nice formulas for, for loci of, uh, you know, for instance, there are nice formulas for the Hurwitz locus inside the moduli space of curves. But yes. you, know, you, could, you could ask for, um, yeah, I guess components inside the Hurwitz space that are given when uh, it doesn't dominate the Hurwitz yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything I've said, Drew, is when it is when it dominates the Hurwitz space. Yeah. So we don't yet know what happens when it doesn't dominate the Hurwitz space. But I think it's a very good problem uh, to try to understand. Yeah, when this uh, when this sort of modified Brownother number row of G 
vector e is um, is negative, can you say uh, what what the locus in the Hurwitz space is? Can you give some description of it? Um, sort of the enumerative geometry has to be harder because these are not um, determinantal loci. It's not a de single determinantal condition, um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think one can imagine some kind. You know, um, there are these situations where. Uh, you know, like uh, Rahul and his gang will study virtual versions of these loci where you don't actually care about you know, the Hurwitz locus anymore, but some, you know, something of the, some class of the expected dimension, but I don't know what the right question is. Anyway, yeah. yeah. No, I think you're asking a very good question. It's, it's something that we've like thought is something interesting to work on. I don't have anything to say, but I think it's definitely a really interesting question. Thanks. Very nice talk. Thank I you. have to go but I enjoyed it. Thanks. Any other quick questions? Yay, oh. quick. Okay, thank you again. So I have a few minute break and then I guess we start again at five o'clock. Hey, hey Vladimir, how you doing? Hi. Hi, 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 good to hear you, yeah. Uh, any noise on the, on the headphones or anything? Everything sounds good. You should be able okay. to share the screen whenever you're... Thank you, let, let me actually do it now, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's, let me bring up some the chat windows and see. Um, Maybe let me change virtual background to something friendly. Um, okay. Ah, this is the house uh, you were born. This is the building I was born in. Yes. Building, they yes. have a coffee shop now. Yeah. It used to be a hospital. Uh, yeah. Have you been in Omsk uh, recently? Uh, yes, last year, last summer. I almost went there in March, uh, but then there was a, a threat that I won't be able to fly back. And uh, I actually never calculated. I had the ticket on a particular day, and this is when they closed the flight out of Moscow. But mm -hmm. I was never sure it was a few hours before or a few hours after. So. Okay, if I could possibly make it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Are you are you flying a lot? With, uh, Me? No. Uh, are you, uh, no, no. Just I not traveling. Impossible. Well, UK is open actually, right? So you just uh, uh, the uh, there's some problem. The we, we went to Spain. I mean, not to Spain to Canaria uh, to Tenerife mm -hmm. for like uh, two weeks and uh, but on the way back we had to stay in quarantine for two weeks mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah that, that's it okay. Vanya, how strict were they with the quarantine i mean they just told you you had to do it uh or okay put it this way uh, no time right now but basically it was very mild so uh they basically uh, on the plane they just told you that uh, you have to go to web page some web page, gov, something dot gov dot uk or something, and read everything you have to do. And you just read it and you just follow. And basically, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's very mild. For example, you can go to buy food, you can go out to buy food. You know what? I'm sorry, I forgot to stop the recording.